Testing, testing, there we go. Okay. Share screen. Okay. So, hi. It's the first day of school. I had a hard time sleeping last night because I was so excited because I love the first day of school. And um, I thought it would have gone away by now, but it hasn't. I still love the first day of school. I'm Dr. Melissa Kalini. I'll be teaching you during this five week one. Um, I'm really excited to teach organic chemistry. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself and my qualifications and why I uh, am qualified to teach you this class. And then I'm gonna talk about the structure of the class. And I'm doing that because uh, you may have heard, many people have heard things about organic chemistry. So just uh, from a raise of your hands, who has heard that organic chemistry is hard? Yeah, that's that's about right. Um, that's what you've heard, but it's not impossible. And we're gonna do it together. It is, I think, a different kind of challenge in the summer because what I normally teach students over the course of three months, September, October, and November, we're learning in five weeks. So it is a really, really rapid schedule, and I encourage students to clear their free time as much as possible, which is not an attitude that I normally have about learning, but because it's such a condensed schedule, the less that you're doing outside of the class, the more time you'll have to devote to the information and be successful. So I really encourage you to do that. I think it's really important to have a healthy work-life balance, but when we're in such a condensed schedule for five weeks, if you scale back on the social life. And if you even can your work life a little bit, it might make things a little bit easier so you can focus on school. Okay, so those are my thoughts. Uh, before we get started at all this semester, I do wanna talk about the fact that the land that we're on um, is an occupied and unceded fees territory of the Wichita and Caddo affiliated tribes. And I also think it's important to recognize that we live in a country that's built on this stolen land with stolen lives. And I think we should all pay gratitude to that and recognize that that's where we're coming from. And although science is a really important way of knowing, and I love science as a way of knowing, there's also indigenous knowledge and other ways of knowing that are really, really valuable. And we have this land we do because of that history. So I like to take a few seconds to just think with gratitude that we have a place to come and learn. And that we have a system that allows us to learn despite the fact that this system came in some less than positive ways. So let's just take a minute and think about that and be grateful. Not a full minute, 10 seconds. Awesome. All right. So um, I think that science is for everyone. I'm a woman in STEM. So people have told me like, oh, I can't believe you do organic chemistry because you're a girl. That's actually happened to me. Um, and I almost quit science because of that. And so I want everyone here to feel that they can come and learn. Everyone deserves a safe space to come and learn. And with that in mind, I ask that you all be respectful of one another while you're in this classroom. And if you can't be kind and respectful, I will ask you to leave. Um, you know, I, I do think that the First Amendment right, freedom of speech is really important, but if someone expresses to you that they're making you're making them uncomfortable with what you're saying and you keep doing it, that just kind of makes you mean. <laughs> and I don't want my classroom to be a mean space. I want my classroom to be a safe space. So if someone expresses that you're making them uncomfortable, please try to um, refrain from engaging in that behavior again, at least while you're in this classroom, out of respect for one another and for me, because I want everyone to be able to learn science well this summer. And I don't want this stuff to get in the way of us learning science well. And we're gonna be together a lot over the next five weeks. So I really want this to be a safe space for everyone. Okay. So we went to, if you haven't had a chance to do this already, you can do it now. Go to tinyurl.com slash chem2370 and submit as many one word answers as you want. I'm going to um, blank the screen and do a little word class. So um, my research is in uh, how students learn organic chemistry. So please don't hold back. 
I've heard it all. I take an anonymous survey asking how people feel about organic chemistry. So I've heard everything. And I don't use any of foul language, but and I'm going to um, take in y'all's responses here. You can also talk amongst yourselves. Introduce yourself to the person around you um, and chat a little bit while I get this pulled up. Oh, my internet's not working. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are you from that area? I don't like but I love that I made with your responses. As you can see, nervous, um, apprehensive, anxious, worried, scared are very prominently displayed. Sad. <laughs> that makes me sad. Um, <laughs> some people said good. Some people said um, excited. Let's see, good-ish. I get that totally. Um, but nervous is by far the largest word because it was by far entered the most. So um, again, my research is on how students learn organic chemistry, and I actually do work on something called meaningful learning. So meaningful learning, a lot of times we think learning is all about how we uh, think about things, right? That's all learning is. But actually, there's a learning theory that says that how you feel about a subject and how you can enact that subject in your life all have to come together for you to actually meaningfully learn something. So actually make connections and not just memorize. And my work is actually in this affective feeling domain. Um, there are studies that show that one of the biggest things that's a predictor for end of semester scores for organic chemistry is actually self-efficacy, which means, do you believe you can do it? And if you believe that you can do well and put the work in that backs that up, you'll get a better grade. So if you can work on some of those feelings that you're experiencing, and try to shift away from nervousness, fear, and the feeling that you might not be successful towards this feeling that you will be successful and you're going to put the work in and you're going to get the outcome that you want, you will be more successful in the course. So that how you're feeling matters. And I think a lot of why we feel nervous is because of what we I know my research actually shows is why people feel the way they do about organic chemistry is the reputation of the course, the pace of the course, and um, then their educators. Those are some of the biggest things. I really care about making it accessible for you. So hopefully I won't be something that makes you feel nervous about the course. But as far as the pace, we're kind of locked in. Unfortunately, I have to prepare you for biochem and for OCHEM 2. And I won't be your OCHEM 2 instructor. Many of you are probably pre-med, so I also have to prepare you for the MCAT. And we only have five weeks. So that pace is going to be a lot. So you should prepare for that as well. And then the reputation of the course, I get to ask students how they feel about organic chemistry. And I ask them all the way through. So I ask students at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the course how they're feeling. And by the end, usually they say, actually, it's not as bad as they thought, but it wasn't as applicable as they wanted it to be. So the material isn't as hard as people make it out to be, but they're kind of disappointed because it's not applicable. 
and they feel like they're doing it for no reason. And my goal in life is to make it so you don't feel like you're learning organic chemistry for no reason. So that's what we're trying to do. And part of why I feel so passionately about this is um, there was a review of all organic chemistry research for how students learn organic chemistry that came out in 2015. And the summary was basically with the way that we're teaching OCHEM right now, students can actually perform and get good grades, but they may not be learning organic chemistry, even the ones who succeed in the class and who get good grades. And then that's not even to mention the students that don't per persist in the class. And I think that's a travesty because organic chemistry is really accessible with the right attitude, the right mindset, the right educator. So I'm gonna do my best that you will meaningfully learn this and that you're not just gonna memorize and you'll be able to know what I want you to know in addition to doing what I want you to be able to do on your assessments. That's my goal, okay? That's my teaching philosophy. So I wanna share a little bit about me. Um, I just so you trust me, right? I think respect, we should all give each other respect, but I'm educating you and that's a big thing for you to put in my hands and trust me. So I like to give my qualifications. Um, I went to UTD, which is right over here in uh, Richardson and got my bachelor of science in chemistry. I so took some time off and worked with my church. And then I came to UNT so that I could be near my family to get my master's and my PhD. My master's is in organic chemistry. I was actually originally pursuing a PhD in organic chemistry, but I didn't love being in the lab all the time. I really loved interacting with students. And so I, I stopped after um, I went through uh, three years of my master's and I, or my PhD for organic chemistry and I got a master's instead. And then I switched programs and got a PhD in something called chemistry education research. And what that is is You've probably heard of education research in the psychology field, and that's general studies about how people learn overall. But uh, chemistry education research focuses on people who have an expertise in the field, who know how they learned chemistry to understand how other people are learning chemistry. So it's part of what's called discipline-based education research. So the people doing that research are all people who have an expertise in the field, and they have that for engineering, for chemistry, for physics, it's present for all of that. Um, and I, having been in OCHEM for a really long time, wanted to learn how people's learning experiences impacted their grades. And I focused in on the emotional domain. So that was what my research was in. I love teaching organic chemistry, but actually I got a bad grade the first time I took organic chemistry, but I got into an OCHEM research lab. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. I should probably learn actually how to do organic chemistry if I'm gonna be like in this lab. So I took the class again, and then I think it's important for us to know that school doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? So when I retook organic chemistry, actually, my mom got cancer. And the second time I took the class, I still didn't learn very much because I was so um, distracted with life. And sometimes that happens, and I wouldn't change that for the world. Um, and then I knew that I really loved the research, though. I learned enough to scrape by in the research lab, and I wanted to be in organic chemistry long term. So I went to grad school for it, and then I learned the material finally at a really good level once I got to grad school. So I like to share that story because sometimes students will get a bad grade on an exam or a quiz and feel like this is like ruining my future. I'm not going to be able to succeed, but I got lots of bad grades on quizzes and exams when I took organic chemistry two times, <laughs> and here I am teaching you. So if you want to to learn something and life gets in the way or you don't have the right study techniques or whatever, that doesn't make you a failure. It doesn't mean you're going to fail. It doesn't mean you're not going to be a doctor. It doesn't mean you're not going to be a nurse. It just means that you didn't do well on one exam. So I like to share about that a little bit. Um, also, probably why I didn't do well is because I recently was diagnosed with ADHD and anxiety. Um, I'm really thirsty for hanging on. I got Adderall to treat my ADHD and anxiety, <laughs> but if I don't take it, there's a distinct scatterbrainedness about me, and I'm also very forgetful, so when, with me as your educator, it's important for you to remind me when I forget to do things, it is not because I don't care. It is literally because there's not enough dopamine in my brain for me to executively function. That is why I don't respond to emails. That is why I'm forgetful, so if you have to email me multiple times, it's not because I hate you, and it's not because I don't care. Um, it really is all about the chemicals in my brain. Um, but also because of this, I think I've learned a lot of study techniques that help me, and I want to share that with y'all. 
Also, if you think you have ADHD, just get tested because it's changed my life to, to be medicated and learn how much it's changed me. So strongly encourage that. I have a chemistry podcast. It's actually the number one chemistry podcast in the United States and in some countries all over the world, um, where I talk about how chemistry applies to everyday life because it does. And I don't think our education system does a really good job of telling you that. I recently did one about how I got diagnosed with ADHD and how the chemicals in your brain work or don't in my case. And um, I really, really love that one. So that just shows you, I just love chemistry and I really want people to be able to find it accessible. So I'm gonna work really hard to include um, like relevant applications. It's hard because we're on such a fast pace, but I want you to see how chemistry that you're learning is gonna apply to your ultimate careers one day. So I'm going to try to embed those in the class and I'll have a um, survey that we do at the end of class today where I will learn about what your careers are so that I can tailor it to this group specifically. Um, and then in the fall, I'm actually leaving UNT. I'm going to the University of Ottawa. I'll still be living here, so you might see me around on campus, but uh, to conduct more chemistry education research on system thinking, which is learning chemistry within a system instead of a isolated class. So that's about me. That's why you should trust me. I've taught organic chemistry many, many times before. I was a TA for the class for five years, and then I started to be an instructor of record. So I've taught the class as a solo instructor many times as well. And then I've taught the Ochem Labs on campus. I've TA'd for pretty much anything you can imagine during my time here getting my PhD. So, and if you have questions about another class, feel free to reach out. Uh, but also I'm a person outside of work, so. And um, this is my sweet family and friends. When I got my PhD, my defense, they came up to visit me and my coworkers. Um, this is my, my podcast co-host, Jan. He does all the audio engineering because I'm bad at technology and administrative detail because I have ADHD. Um, this is my research group. All these women also do uh, research in chemistry education and trying to learn how people learn organic chemistry. Um, this person right here, Dr. Molly Atkinson, does research on an eye tracker, which is really cool. She literally has a computer that can watch what your eyes are looking at to help her understand how students are interpreting representations of molecules. So like when we look today at the different ways we can represent molecules, she puts that on a screen and has students look at it and see what they're looking, what they're taking away from it at a deeper level than even words can express because she's literally following their eyes. It's really, really cool. Um, so chemistry education research is amazing. <clears throat> this is my husband. We love eating. So that's us eating ceviche in the car together after a family vacation. Uh, that's one of my number one hobbies is eating food and making food. Um, and I also sometimes take ice skating lessons, although gas prices have made it, inflation, whatever, have made it hard to get down to the um, skating rink. So I haven't been doing that as much lately. But even cuter than that is my nephew is learning how to play hockey. Look at those little hockey pants. They're so cute. Um, so that's a little bit about my family. And then I don't have pets, but I do have plants. I have a lot of plants. Um, so if you want to talk to me about plants, I'd love to. So that's some about me outside of work. So I hope you can trust, um, trust me to educate you. And before we move on, I'm just going to open it up because I like active learning. I don't want to lecture at you all day. Although today, I kind of have to because I'm telling you about the class. But what questions do you have about me that I didn't already answer? Yes. It's called Chemistry for Your Life. Thank you for asking. You can get it anywhere you get podcasts. And it's under the chemistry section. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, okay, well, I feel like I go through phases of liking some more than others. But right now I'm really into this cilia. It looks like lily, water lilies, you know? And my boss gave it to me and it was really tiny and it's like exploding. Um, but this one right here, you can barely see it. It's called a polythia and it's a succulent and it has like little windows on the top that are clear. And um, I might get emotional when I say this, but I found it, it's very, very rare. And I found it on sale at Kroger of all places. Um, my mom got cancer again when I was in grad school and she went into the hospital and didn't come out. And I found it right before that happened. So it was kind of like a bright spot in a terrible day. And it's grown so big. So that's one of my other favorite plants. Like probably if there was a fire, I would grab that one. <laughs> Maybe that and my laptop. <laughs> that's where all my research is. 
Thank you, Cassie. That was a good question. Any other questions? I thought I saw a hand over here that maybe. Okay. Well, I really um I really love teaching and I really love my students and I'm excited to get to know y'all and I want you to feel like you also get to know me. So if you do have any questions or you want to chat with me, feel free to come up to me after class and we can always talk. Okay, so my goals for this course is one, I want you to learn organic chemistry. I want you to learn how to study for organic chemistry because it's kind of different. We're getting into the nitty gritty of the course now, by the way. Um, I want you to learn how to study for organic chemistry because I think it's different than other classes you've learned. Some people will tell you don't memorize anything at all. I don't think that's helpful. There are things that it's just easier to memorize so you don't have to worry about it every time you come to your papers you know, to look at stuff. But you can't memorize everything, especially when you get into Ochem 2, which I actually am not teaching Ochem 2 this summer. Dr. Bear here will be teaching Ochem 2 because I'm going to Ottawa. Um, but you'll there's so much to learn in Ochem 2 that memorizing is part of why people feel overwhelmed by the scope. So if you can focus on learning the concepts now, that will help you not have to memorize everything as we go through later. Um, the other thing is I want to make science accessible. I want you guys to succeed. I want you to feel like you can do it. And I want you to see the relevance in everyday life. So I want to teach you the course material and prepare you for your next classes, of course, but also I want you to see how this is work. And I already went through this. Okay, here's the schedule. And I do try to build in that active learning, the emotional side. So I'll do check-ins and ask how y'all are doing, how you're feeling about the material, what we need to change. And then, um, the cognitive part is kind of me lecturing, but so I'll lecture and then I'm also going to give you guys opportunities to do the work yourself. And then um, I built my course schedule around that. Before I talk about this, did y'all raise your hand if you got the email I sent? Great. Did you get the announcement this morning with the TikTok videos? Great. Okay. So I'll do those a lot of times before we get to class. They're not required, but they'll just help you. It's kind of like we're going so fast paced. What I can use those videos to do is give you like a quick overview of what we're going to learn. And then we'll go over it again in class. And then because you've now had it twice, then we can get time to do practice problems. And research shows that doing practice problems helps the most, right? So that's what I want to use our class time is for you to do practice problems while I'm here for you to ask questions. So. That's part of why I do those videos. If you can do those and get the concepts down before we get to class, or just not get them down, but get a basic idea of what we're going through, then when we're in class, you're getting it deeper a second time. We're like doing a next pass through, and then I'll be able to build in this recitation time where you can do practice problems. So I also broke the course down into most chemistry courses are 50 minutes. Sometimes it's an hour 20. But so what I did is we'll go until um, about 1150 and then we'll take a break and that will be class one. And then we'll come back at, at noon and do class two. Um, sadly, this class is right during lunchtime. What the heck? So if you need to have a snack or something, totally, totally okay. Um, just try not to be distracting or bring something in that smells too gross. So I'll try to kind of follow that schedule on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, the last 30 minutes of class or so, I'm going to give you recitation packets and I'll have you work in groups and talk over some practice problems together. This will be an active class where you're working and talking to each other, um, but that will be for a completion grade. And then on um, every Wednesday, we'll have a quiz. You'll get a drop quiz. The goal of these quiz is literally for you to practice. Um, and see what the questions are going to be like before you get to the exam. When Dr. Bearhay comes in for summer two, his class is structured differently. He only does four exams and a final. I think he drops one of them. And then you can, I think, sometimes do a homework system for extra credit. Um, I think that even though it's a little bit more that you have to prepare for, building in some accountability with those quizzes helps students learn how to study. So that's part of why I'm doing that for you. And I will try to model, I've worked with Dr. Berhey for years, so I'll try to model some of my exam questions after things that he would do. Um, and then we'll have an exam every Monday. One of those will be dropped. And then we'll have our final exam. This, this last week is weird because Monday is July 4th. So instead of going to school Monday through Thursday that last week, we're going to school Tuesday through Friday. It's like push back. Okay. 
think that's everything about the calendar. Oh, and then I'll have you do homework. I will go through each individual part. The homework is due Friday. Um, what I'm going to have you do is there's practice problems for each chapter that the answers are already there. So I'm not checking to see if you get the right answer. I'm checking to see if you're doing the work. So I want you to do the practice problems. And then I have posted video solutions that go with the practice problems. So you can do the practice problems, upload them. You can look at the videos. And actually, there's a lot of research that shows if you practice it and then you watch someone else do it, that helps you learn it better, right? So you try to do it yourself, then watch my videos and see what you did right or wrong. And that will help. But what I'll do for grading is I just will choose like two or three random questions per chapter to check to see if you did the work. And that's how I'll grade them. So I call that spot grading. And it's due Friday, which is not a day that we technically have class, but basically I'm just giving you an extra day after the weekends you have until midnight. And I just am going to have you upload your work. It doesn't matter if it's crazy. Just make sure that the, the numbers are clearly like circled or squared or whatever so I can find those questions I'm checking for. But really, I just want you to show me that you did work on these practice problems in your free time. It's just built in accountability. Again, I have ADHD. I need accountability. If I don't have deadlines, I don't do my work. So that really helps me. You might be the kind of student who doesn't need accountability. And for you, you might like Dr. Barry's class structure better because maybe you just want to take exams. But I can't function like that. So <laughs> that's why I've built the class this way. OK. And then I already talked about the videos. Sometimes I'll do that after class. Like if I'm in class and I see students are like, oh, I'm confused about this. I'll do like a, OK, here's what we're doing in class today. The ones I posted today are old videos. Um, and I have some that I'll probably post this afternoon that are old, but as we go through this, this semester, I'll start making videos for y'all specifically. Um, so this is your grade breakdown. 15% uh, is course participation. So that's the recitation work. And then sometimes we'll have like today, the survey that I'll have is a participation grade. And um, I'll probably have a grace of like, oh, if you miss one or two classes, so that's still 100%. Like I can scale it up. Not guaranteed, but probably. Um, but part of that is because you have to show up to class to learn organic chemistry, especially on this map piece. Like you have to. And if you miss it, it's really hard to catch up because we're basically covering like a week's worth of material in one day, which is hard about summer school, but it's just kind of the way it is. And I'll also record my lectures so that you can watch them after the fact if you do have to miss for any reason to help you stay caught up. So barring a technical difficulties, you should be able to catch up. And then I do an example of how to calculate your grade because students ask me a lot. So you'll take the average, um, like if you're 95% of classes, do the decimal of that times the, the number of percentage points it's worth. And then that'll give you the breakdown and you just add it all up. Um, and there are extra credit opportunities in this course. I'll go over those in a minute. So I do participation because studies show that consistency in practicing the work and accountability both aid in performance. Um, and those will be the recitation grades and the in-class question. If you miss class for a reason that you feel is an exception, if you're very ill, if you had a family situation come up, if, you know, I don't know, you had car trouble, I don't want you to feel that you can't reach out to me and let me know what's going on. Um, my attendance policy isn't like, no questions asked. If you miss, that's it. It's sometimes I can make exceptions for that. Um, and if you feel mentally or especially physically ill, please don't come to class. I do not want to get sick. I'm going on like the vacation of a lifetime after this class. So I'm not trying to have long COVID. I'm not trying to not be able to taste the food that we're going to eat when we go there. And this is like my husband and I's big honeymoon type trip because we didn't do anything while I was in grad school. So please don't get me sick. Or the people around you. If you don't feel good, stay home. I'll send you the recording. It'll be okay. Um, and communicate with me. But don't just like say, oh, I'm not feeling well over and over and never come to class. That's not going to help you at all. And I don't have the time or mental capacity to work with you to make up for something if you're just abusing this privilege. So um, for homework, I also do that, again, because consistency in practice problems and accountability aids in performance. So that's, again, to help you. Um, and then they're in chapter practice problems. So let's go to, uh, I'm going to do the student view. So this is, should be what you see. Uh, I don't know why I did this. Okay. 
Okay, so this should be roughly what you see. So this syllabus has a schedule, the grade breakdown, all of that. Um, this is the PowerPoint I'm going over right now. This is a document I emailed out about tips for how to succeed. Um, there's extra resources. I'll go over those in a minute. And then the chapter practice problems just are multiple choice. They come from the same test bank where Alpha questions um, for your exams, although I do change the questions for your exam. So it's not exactly the same as the test bank. So like this says greatest degree. I may say what has the least degree, you know, or whatever, but it's very similar to these practice problems. It'll be from that same test bank. Um, and then there's usually also a, oh, that's not what I wanted. There's usually also uh, the answer key on there. And then what I'll do is embed my YouTube videos, which are, if you go to youtube.com slash organic Melissa, that's me. Um, I have a playlist of OKIM OK one practice problems. So every chapter practice problem is it's low production value. It's not always this um, blurry. I don't know why this one looks like that, but it's low production value. It's literally just me on a webcam. But for some, I made these like out of a desperate attempt to get students to um, come to recitation during COVID. And I've never gotten so much good feedback on anything in my life. Students love these videos, I guess, because they can watch them any time of day. So it's kind of like a mobile recitation type thing. Um, so you can watch me work out the problems. And while I'm working them out, I say like, okay, this is how I approach the problem. And you can, you can literally watch me think through the problem as I'm going through it. Um, but I also have a few other playlists of things that students have just requested over uh, over the years. I have uh, tips and tricks for success. Oh, we don't need to listen to that. Um, topical reviews. This one has is probably something that you guys will want to look at because when students ask like the same question over and over and over again about a specific topic, I learned to make a video about that so I could point them to that first so they could watch it even when they don't have access to me. So these will be questions that you probably have questions or like topics that you'll probably have questions about. And you can just come uh, check these out. And then as, as our semester goes on, if there's a new one that pops up that people are asking questions about a lot, I'll make videos of those as well. Um, so that's what your homework is all about. Um, so yeah, it won't be a it won't be a grade for did you get the right answers because I'm giving you the right answers it's a grade for are you trying to learn this material um, and if you're late that's better than nothing so please 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 turn in late work just email me ask me to open up the thing and I'll accept it late I would rather you have late work than nothing yes mm -hmm. there's an online uh, homework section that I can get it for you Uh, assignments, I think. Homework. So you just come in here and you can um, upload, you hit start assignment and upload file. And students, you know, have their different preferences. If you work it on your iPad, you can just upload your iPad work. If you work it on paper, you can take pictures of that. Or there's apps that will like scan a picture and make it a PDF. You know, however you want to show that you did the work. I don't care. I just want to see that you did the work. And so you'll turn it in on that online portal just to show that you did the work. So it'll be within your Canvas website. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Um, okay, that's the homework. For quizzes, I will tell you the day before the quiz what's going to be on it because recalling information without notes, I want you to use your notes on your homework. I want you to use your notes in recitation. I want you to not use your notes on your quiz. Um, I may give you like a little short study guide where it's like things that you're having trouble memorizing you can like use a note card or something um i think i maybe decided that i don't know for sure um <laughs> but i again adhd but i think it's important for you to practice in the same similar environment to what the exam is going to be like and for you to see those kinds of practice problems that you're also going to have on the exam so that's what the quizzes are for they're not to like oh no, I'm going to pull your grade down with this quiz. They really are to help you 
practice and see what absences or like what you're missing, what gaps in your knowledge you have. Yes. Great. So I did decide that. There you go. I'd made a lot of these decisions really late last night. So, <laughs> um, so I'll tell you every Tuesday what to expect. I'm going to say, oh yeah, open hand right now. I'm going to say there will be a question like this, a question like this, a question like this. I won't tell you the specifics, but I'll tell you the exact topic because that's what I want you to study and learn. So, and then you can bring in a little note card or something that it has to be handwritten because I want you to practice writing it that you can refer to. Um, I'll drop one quiz that's to account for any absences or conflicts or if you have like an unavoidable event. Um, again, if you feel mentally or physically ill, please don't come to class. We don't want to get sick. But if you um, reach out to me, I can try to work with you on doing a makeup on it. And um, you'll have to be very quick because I need to be able to get the quizzes back to you before the weekend. So that, like to all the students so that there's um, you have it before your exam. And then sometimes you can get a dean approved absence if you have to go to the doctor or if you have a major life event. Um, if that happens, if we don't have time for you to take a makeup test because you're dealing with whatever that situation is or makeup quiz, I'll take the average of your other scores with a dropped one. So like if it's a quiz, you miss one for a Dean excused absence, I'll drop one and the average of your two best will make up that third one too. So basically it's just totally excused. And I'll do the same thing for exams if you have the Dean excused absence. Um, and again, the exam partially is because recalling information without notes will aid you in creating long term understanding and memories, but also you have to be prepared for open two for the MCAT for whatever you're doing later in life. Yes. That's a good question. The quizzes are um, in the past, I've done all for your response on the quizzes because that's typically what people struggle with the most on the exams is actually like there's a few for response questions at the end. And you have so much practice of multiple choice because I give those multiple choice practice problems. Um, but I have to hand grade all of y'all's quizzes before the next day, every Wednesday. So I'm thinking I might scale back on the free response and do a few multiple choice. Haven't fully decided. So the answer is not sure. <laughs> what do you say? How many questions? Uh, what I did in the past was usually have about four for your response questions, but they sometimes have multiple uh, parts because like sometimes they have to draw mechanisms and like looking for arrows and stuff like that. Uh, but I will definitely tell you, I'm going to make your first quiz today. So I'll tell you before the quiz on Tuesday, two quizzes on Wednesday, I'll tell you exactly what you can expect. For the quiz? No, like four. They're 20 points, usually. We usually like four. I have 20 to 30 questions on the exam. And you'll only have 20 minutes. Maybe I said 20 questions. You'll have 20 minutes. Did I say 20 questions? Sorry. Um, sometimes my brain works slower than my mouth. So if I ever say something confusing like that, always clarify. Um, like four questions, 20 minutes. So take it, sorry, 20 to 25 minutes. Sorry that I made that mistake. Are we clear on the quizzes? Did I clarify my error? Okay, good. <laughs> sorry about that. Again, scatterbrain. Um, so yeah, there will probably be some multiple choice in free response for your exams. There'll be 50 minutes at the beginning of class. You get one dropped exam as well. Same thing if you feel physically ill, please don't come to class. Arrange with me. We'll try to make it up as quickly as we can, but we have to have a fast turnaround time because of this uh, pace of the course. And again, the dean approved absence is the same. And then you'll have a final exam. This one's only multiple choice um, for the same reasons as we have regular exams. You'll have about two hours on that, so it'll be longer. And it's also to help prepare you for your final exam, which will be the ACS exam at the end of Open 2. I believe Dr. Griffey uses the ACS exam. Um, and if your final grade is better than any of your other exam grades, I will replace your lowest exam grade with your final grade, because my goal is for you to learn the information. So if you learn it better by the end of the semester, I'm happy to replace your lowest 
peptic dendrite. So say you get like a 70, an 80, and a 90. The 70 will be your drop rate. You'll have an 80 and a 90. And then you go into your final and you get a 90 on that too. Now you have two 90s on your exam and a 90 on the final. Don't rely on that to bring up your grade, but if don't panic if you're not doing as well as you think you should be doing, because I build in a lot of opportunities for you to make up grades if you go. Um, same thing with the Dean Approved Absent. So extra credit, there's two ways to get extra credit. One is there's a Chemistry is for Everyone essay. Um, you can write an essay about uh, a chemist that you identify with. It has to be a chemist. People try to do doctors. I want you to already know about doctors. I want you to learn about chemists. I want you to see opportunities in chemistry that you might not know about. And I want you to see someone who you identify with in some way who's doing that. So like, I would love to do a science communicator because I identify with them or a woman because I'm a woman, you know, whatever aspect you identify with them, that's fine. But I want to, uh, I want you to have the opportunity to see people who you identify with doing science. And I have the rubric for that laid out in the syllabus. Um, and also it helps to see the relevance in everyday life. And then also have student drop-in hours. These are sometimes called office hours, but office hours are confusing. I think the phrase office hours is confusing because people think that's when I'm working. I'm not working, I work outside of that time. Office hours are for you. So I started to try to call them student drop-in hours. This is time I have set aside for you to drop in. And if you come drop in, I will give you extra uh, credit on your final grade because I want to get to know you and also because Students who come to drop in hours do better than students who don't, because a lot of times learning something totally new like organic chemistry, you're going to need help. And this is where I can help you. Yes. For the exams, I will most likely make a YouTube video. So just to save us on class time and because everybody has the same questions after quizzes and exams, I make a video key usually, not on the final, but for quizzes and exams throughout the course. So that way, again, I grade the exam, I get it back to you, and then you're able to take the exam with you, look at it, study it, and prepare for your final using that. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, what are the student hours that you use to do the Yes, well, I uh, try to take that into account. The student drop-in hours are right before class on, I think, Tuesday, Thursday. It is that we don't have quizzes so that you can come in in between and get help before your quiz. Um, and they're from 10 to 11 right upstairs in my office. Um, I know some of you are also taking labs and stuff before. So if you can't come to that time, you can also just schedule an appointment with me and we can do it on Zoom or we can do it after class. Um, I just need to know ahead of time. And my I my office is in a lab group, right? So we like have a big shared space. So I preserve the space for my office hours before, but after is like group working hours. So a lot of people are there. So we'll just probably have to like meet in the hallway or you know try to find somewhere more private not hard to do that in the chemistry building in the summer so we can find a place but the set ones where the lab should be mostly empty and y'all are welcome to come at will those are right before class right upstairs to make it easy for you to get to me great and um sitting alone in my office is boring students are always like sorry for coming to office hours I'm like okay well what else would I be doing during that time because I can't start working on something because if somebody comes by then I'm going to have to stop and it's hard for me to like get back into it. Right. So I'm, I just like sit there. So please, I love it when students come to office hours. And that's like, I have, I have former students who became friends of mine who like did research with me and who I like know their kids now because they came to office hours all the time. Right. So I don't want to just sit alone in my office hours. So please come. I don't remember exactly the points I said, but you can look in the syllabus. And if everyone in the class does that, I'll make chemistry cookies for the final. I didn't tell you guys this, but I also like to bake. That's one of my hobbies. So like I made my own wedding cake and I made these cute onesie cakes for my friend's baby shower. And I made these Mr. Rogers sweaters cake for my friend's baby's first birthday. So I've been wanting to try chemistry ones. So if y'all all come to office hours or schedule an appointment with me this summer in the next five weeks, I will set aside the day before the final and make these cookies. Great. Okay. 
So let's go to Canvas. Does everyone have access to Canvas? Has everyone figured out how to do it? I know, raise your hand if you don't go to UNT normally. Yes, yeah, so this is a common thing in the summer. I think UNT is one of the only schools around that offers OCHEM in the summer. Is that correct? I'm assuming. Yeah, so a lot of people who don't usually go here come in the summer. So sometimes that's difficult, but you've all figured out how to get to Canvas, right? If you haven't, please reach out to me. Canvas is like how I communicate with you. I strongly encourage you to make sure that your, um, you can like make sure that your announcements go into your email. That's how I get information out is by announcements. Like that's how I communicate with students. The only reason I sent the direct email is because the course wasn't activated before the semester, but it's just way easier for me to go into announcements and just blast that out for people. So announcements have that ready to go. Um, your grades will be listed on here as well. It says out of 20, but I try to, it's always a percentage. If you're not sure your grade is just divided by the total. I try to make it be a percent, uh, percentage when we'll see. And you can also email your peers if you go uh, to the people tab, if you like want to reach out to someone, but you don't want to ask for their phone number or something, you can like click on this person. Sorry, Ainsley, for calling you out. And you should be able to message them. Or maybe you go to inbox and message them, but you can do that. Okay. And then, oh, I lost it. Okay, access tonight. Great. I want to go back to where I can go. There we go. You can also go to modules and you'll see the syllabus. You'll see um, how to be successful in organic chemistry. This is extra resources. So um, organic chemistry is, is difficult and students oftentimes ask me for extra practice problems and tips and tricks on studying. One of the, my favorite things that I love is something called um, doodles in the membrane. Hopefully this doesn't crash the browser. where someone made their organic chemistry notes in beautiful artwork. I'm not an artist. I like charts. So I won't ever make notes like this because I'm boring, but some people really resonate with this. I've had students who really want their work, their notes to be more artistic and help them visualize. So you can, I kind of wanted you to have this as an example or also another place to come and look and get a secondary source of information. We don't have a TA or anything like that in the course, which kind of puts you at a disadvantage because Usually you could ask me questions and then the TA and you'd get like two different types of information from two different people who could maybe one can identify with you better. But there is something called the Chemistry Tutoring Center, the CRC, where you can go and get help, Chemistry Resource Center. Um, well, it's not going to say, maybe it will. And there's even a schedule where it has like it's upstairs, right above us, right there, that direction. There's a computer lab and then a room with a bunch of tables um, that's like straight across from diagonal from the glass office on that floor. And those doors are usually open and they tell you who's good at P at OCHEM, right? So Joseph would be the only person who's good at OCHEM. So you can go during Joseph's hours and get help if something I'm saying is not connecting with you. There's also the organic chemistry tutor YouTube. I've heard really good things about him. I've also heard really good things from Leah for Sai. Um, so you don't only have to rely on, on my disseminating you information, you can get information from other people. So um, there's also like additional practice problems and stuff like that that are all listed here for you to go look at. So um, I think that's everything. You'll turn in your homework under assignment. These you don't have to worry about. Um, these will be ones that I just enter in, so you don't have to worry about that at all. Any questions or what questions you have about Canvas, if any? I'll upload your notes also under the modules. Uh, you'll see them appear as we go. So like chapter one practice problems, chapter one answer key, I'll upload the chapter one notes and I'll upload um, a link to the video as well as we go. And then I'll, then chapter two will appear tomorrow. Okay. Um, I wanted to review Canvas. Um, what questions do you have about the syllabus? We pretty much covered the syllabus today in this, but I wanted to 
open it up. If, what if any questions do you have? Yes. How big are we allowed to have rent for this? We'll tell you on Tuesday. I had I had delusions of grandeur that I was going to have everything ready and take a week off, and I um just didn't do that. I struggle to procrastinate. Whenever you guys are like, you're gonna people don't come to office hours because they think I'm gonna judge them for their questions or drop in hours. I'm like, I've done everything you've done and worse when it comes to not doing my homework. So please. Please don't think I'm going to judge you because I also am bad at doing homework on time. And I am, I'm the annoying kid in class who asks questions. Like every class I've ever been in, I'm like, then my teacher's like, you have a lot of questions. And they say it like it's nice, but I know they're kind of annoyed. But I'm not annoyed because I want you to ask questions because I hate it when my questions don't get answered. So you can always ask me questions. Uh, anything else? No, that's a really good question. So, I mean, people have different policies, right? I think that textbooks are kind of a scam. Like, it makes me so mad that you have to pay so much money. And I put myself through school. I didn't have money, right? So just, like, spend $100 on textbooks. And Ochem has not changed that much. So I think I have, where's my required materials section? Here. So there's no required materials. What I would rather you spend your money on is um, a modeling kit. Um, I brought mine with me because we're going to do chapter one today. A modeling kit um, is really, really helpful. There's the American Chemical Society uh, Organic Chemistry Study Guide. They have really good practice problems that will be helpful for you at the end um, if you're taking OCHEM 2 to kind of review. So. Um, that's something or any organic chemistry book that is easily available to you whether that's through pdfs which are illegal and i cannot condone or an old version that you can buy used I, i'm fine with that um also it is illegal and you should not use the acs organic chemistry pdf study guide that is illegally on your own Okay. Um, and then there's also a really good book called Organic Chemistry as a Second Language by Klein that I encourage to like go along with practice problems and again to get a different to get a different um because you don't have a TA. So he explains stuff differently than me. And he has really good something's called scaffolded practice problems where he'll like ask a little question and then like a little bit more and then a little bit more and then a little bit more and then before you know it, you're doing the practice problem. And I've had a ton of good feedback over that, even from when I was a student all the way up till now. And sometimes I even take those practice problems and use them in recitation work. It's so helpful. Yes. That's a good question. Yeah. Solomon's textbook is what my lectures line up with. Most textbooks are very similar for organic chemistry, unless it's something called mechanisms first we do what's called a functional group approach. So I recommend doing um, a, a functional groups approach book. If, so Solomon's is that way. Client actually has a textbook, not the organic chemistry as a second language, but he also has a textbook or uh, Wade also is a good one. Those are the probably the top three that I recommend. And you can get old versions of those for cheap and it's totally illegal to get PDFs of those online. Okay, but don't get a virus. Um, I think that's everything. I just know that I don't want anyone to be financially strained for materials for this course. You can get these for like twenty dollars on Amazon. Um, get the one. Get one that there's like some that have these like crazy sticks that are hard to put together. But I recommend getting one that's just like the balls with the sticks you can put in, and the balls are already made for the modeling kit. They're really, really helpful for um, chapter five, especially, but if you can't afford one, you can come to my office and use this anytime. We have extras in there that you can sit and use.
Uh, so this is one of the best things I recommend. And then also, you know, I think the ACS study guide and the Klein book are really helpful for practice problems. And then I, I honestly don't refer to the textbook very often. I teach you what I think it's important for you to know. What the textbook does is, again, give you another way of thinking about the material and offer clarification in case you're confused. So I don't force you to go to the textbook very much, but students have really enjoyed it in the past. Any other syllabus questions? Those are good ones. Right. Okay. Um, so for my tips and tricks for organic chemistry, um, the biggest thing is actually I'm I'm gonna go into how to take good notes. So organic chemistry is again pretty different than what you've done in the past. One thing that I try to tell people is it's it's kind of like you're learning a new language and then you're immediately expected to be fluent in that new language, even more so in this course than in normally paced organic chemistry courses. So I think it's challenging to actually know how to study. And a lot of times students will come to me and be like, I've spent hours studying and I'm getting bad grades. And my first question is, what are you doing to study? Let's let's tweak your study techniques because I don't think I think it's a work differently, not work harder kind of a situation usually. So I recommend, and this is different for me than other people, but I recommend that when you're in class, all the PowerPoints will be put up. So only write down things that won't be on the recording and that won't be on the PowerPoint so that you can take in the information. So I want you to be taking in the information. If writing helps you, that's fine, but I want your priority to be taking in the information. I'm gonna post the recording, I'm gonna post the PowerPoint. And then I um, want you to do practice problems and write out practice problems so that you can go back over them later. Then after we've covered a chapter, so we're gonna try to do about a chapter a day at the beginning as time goes on, um, I recommend you go back and review the PowerPoints, but don't copy them. Just like look over them to remind yourself of the material and then condense down the main ideas. So basically, there are 66 PowerPoint slides in this chapter or something like that. You don't need to write down 66 things. You need to be able to synthesize the information for yourself. So think about what are the big concepts we went over in this chapter and whether you like to draw pictures, charts, lists, make a list of those things. Like for today, we're gonna to talk about different types of bonding, what's hybridization, electronegativity, you know, make a list of those things and sort of do a study guide for yourself out of your notes in whatever way it makes sense to you. So like that doodles in the membrane, whatever. And then you have a study guide. So when you go through your practice problems, you can just look at your study guide. It's like condensed the information so you don't have to be flipping through all these PowerPoints. You could say, oh, I remember hybridization. That's right here on my notes. This is what I have about it. And you're, every time you're doing that, you're solidifying that concept map and the organization in your mind of all the information you learned. So as you're doing practice problems, look at your notes for that and then do the practice problems. And then if you find a gap, like, oh shoot, I didn't, I didn't have anything in my notes about this one thing, or I keep making this same mistake, I'm gonna make a little note on my study guide to pay attention to this, or I'm gonna add this little section. And that kind of helps you find the areas of what you are missing. Um, and it should tell you how important I think it is that we're taking class time to teach you how to take notes, because I think this is one of the biggest things that helps students be successful. And we are on such a condensed schedule that it's like literally a sacrifice for me to do this. We're taking time away for you to learn. It's that important that you take good notes because that is one of the things that makes or breaks people. Um, and then sometimes memorizing is needed. I like to use flashcards for memorizing and then I just like take them with me wherever I go. So I used to wait tables. That's how I got myself through college. I'd put them in my apron and when it was slow, I'd go to like the terminal and just like, I would get in trouble. So I'd have to do it subtly and I'd just like flip through them, you know? Or when I'm brushing my teeth, I would do it. Um, if you're walking, one of my students was like, I would walk right in the street. And I was like, okay, well don't put yourself in danger. <laughs> don't do it in a not safe way, but yeah, just flash through them whenever you get the chance. Another thing I did, um, this was when I got to grad school and I was studying for this like to be my career. So I was kind of intense about it. 
um, I recorded myself doing like audio flashcards. So I'd be like, this wasn't it, but I'd be like, what's two plus two? And then I'd pause and then I'd say four so that I could listen to it while I was driving and answer or going on walks or working out. So that was like a way to build studying in while I was doing my regular life stuff. Um, so we're kind of on a fast pace. You guys are going to have other things going on in your life. These are ways that you can study without needing to bring too many materials. Another way to study without bringing too many materials is just ask yourself what we did in class today. So I'll do that at the beginning of every class is I'll say, okay, what did we learn yesterday? But if you do that yourself, you're interrupting your forgetting process and you're solidifying those like long-term memory pathways in your brain. So when you leave the class, say, what did we learn in class today? You don't have to write anything down. You don't have to have any materials with you. You can just try to remember. And then when you get to your notes, you'll be like, oh, I forgot about this one thing that we did in class today. You know, or when you're brushing your teeth or whatever, you don't even have to have materials with you to study or to practice for this class. So those are ways to kind of embed that in. Um, so how to do well in organic chemistry, show up. That's one of the biggest things. The first week for this class, it's usually like the first three weeks of regular classes, is really kind of slow. It's like, oh, we're relearning OCHEM, or we're relearning Gen Chem stuff, or we're doing nomenclature. All oh, this is really easy. This kind of makes sense to me. And then it gets really hard really fast, because then I'm going to ask you to start visualizing molecules, and students are like, they kind of took the easy other oh, like oh this is easy I don't need to work as hard as I do and then they get slammed <laughs> so please 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 don't fall into that trap I see it every semester so even though it feels easy at the beginning it like ramps up really fast so don't don't not come to class or anything and um, answer questions engage do the recitation work I've put those things in there not to torture you or to give you busy work but literally to help you be successful based on research so that's kind of why I built the class the way I did Again, make those study guides out of your own notes. Don't memorize everything. I'll tell you what things I think are going to be helpful for you to memorize. Um, do lots of practice problems. And when you're doing practice problems, I recommend not looking at the answers right away. So do a practice problem. Try to do it without looking at your notes. When you've come to a point that you feel like you do need your notes, then look at your notes. And then come back and answer it and do the next one. And the reason I say to do that and not look at the answer is because if you're constantly checking the answer as soon as you finish, then when you get to the quiz or the exam and you don't have the answer right there, you start to panic about whether or not you're doing it right. So you want to practice doing questions without being able to check your answer right away because you're not going to be able to check your answer right away on the exam. If at first you want to do like a few and check the answer, to make sure you're getting the concepts right, that's great. But don't always do that because then you'll get to the exam and, and suddenly realize that you were studying in a way that was not the same that the exam environment is. And so students kind of have that as a downfall as well. Um, but practice problems is kind of the biggest thing. So I want you to organize your notes so that you can use them to do practice problems. I don't want you to just review your notes over and over. Organic chemistry is, there's no math in it. It's more like a puzzle. But reading about how to do a puzzle isn't going to help you do the puzzle. You, you have to do the puzzle. Just like reading about how to do math doesn't help you do math. You have to do the math, right? So um, I really, really encourage you to condense your notes down to the big ideas and then use that to do practice problems so that you're actually using the ideas and not just reading them and not knowing how to put them into play. Those are some pitfalls to avoid. And then again, watch the video after your attempt. A recent chemistry education research article came out about using tutorial videos in class. And all of that uh, paper showed that students who watch the video and then do it um, don't do as well on assessments as students who practice and then watch the video and then see what they did wrong. Well. So that's the way to do it. You could do it either way. You have the video, you have the practice problems, do whatever you want. But studies show that doing the practice problem and then watching the video and then being like, oh, this is what I did right, this is what I did wrong is gonna be better for you. So that's my recommendation. Okay, what questions do you have about the class? We're a little bit over for our break time. I promise I'm aware of that, but I wanna answer your questions about the class before you go to chapter one. Yes. Are you gonna post like every day, like the new things or are you gonna post a week at a time? I wanna post a whole week at a time, but again, 
<laughs> I'm learning because of my ADHD. I struggle with procrastination. So I want to do that. That's my goal. Post a whole week at a time. Everything's up. But I might not always do that. But I really try hard for my students because I know it helps people to have the material ahead of time to accommodate that. So I will do my absolute best to make that happen. Part of it too is that all the PowerPoints suck. They're so ugly. And I just used them last semester that I taught this. And I kind of feel like it detracted from learning. So I'm actually going through and redoing all of my PowerPoints. So it, it takes a little bit longer to post the material because I want you to have good material. So probably should have chosen to do that in a five week course, but I did. The homeworks will come up. Yeah, they'll, I can do those easily. Those are already ready. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a good idea. Yeah, I can post the whole week homework right now. The homework and the videos are already up. And I can post the old crappy PowerPoints if you want so that you have notes to look at. Uh, they just suck there. And the information is presented in a way that's like, there's so many words that you didn't have to say on this PowerPoint slide. <laughs> like I took 70 slides and made it into, I think, 63 or 64 last night. Because I was like, what is this? <laughs> okay, any other questions? That was a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I will try to have your quizzes back to you the next day. That's part of why makeup quizzes are hard in the summer is because I I give you the quiz so you can practice for the exam. So I want you to have it back before the exam on Monday. So I'm going to try to, you're going to take your quizzes on Wednesday, I think. I'm going to try to get your quizzes back to you by Thursday so that you can practice over the weekend. Um, and then your exams are on Monday, and I'm going to try to have those back to you before the quiz so that you can see what from the exam you're missing. If I can't get them back to you because grading 50 to 60 students is kind of a lot, I will definitely put up the video key before your next thing. So you can at least go back and look at the questions that you're like, wait, what was I confused on? So we'll at least have that. Um, so you'll get your grades back rapidly, and then you can use that grade calculator that I have, that slide on there, to figure out roughly where you stand. Yeah. I think that's really important. I think uh, in order for quizzes and tests not to be busy work, you have to be able to use it to review what you understand, what you don't understand. So I try very, very hard to get graded material back quickly. That's a good one. What other questions do you have? Okay, this is a lot of information that I just like threw at you really quickly. A lot about how to be successful in the course, a lot about how the course structure is. I'll try to remind you of some of these techniques as we go through. And then I'll post, I made a video, it was from last semester, but I made a video that was like how to organize your notes well. So it's from a topic that's like advanced from what you're doing now, but it will kind of help you give the idea of what I mean when I say like study guides. Don't worry about understanding what the words I'm actually saying are, but just kind of see the concepts. And then um, I also have some videos on YouTube where I go through like, here's what you can do to be successful in organic chemistry, you know, so I have those that you can review as well. It's kind of just me saying the same things over and over because I know it's like so much information that I want students to be able to access it whenever they they can. Okay. Um, so I think that's everything. I do want to give one more opportunity for questions before we go into our break. Okay, great. Well, thanks. I'm really excited. Um, I've spent this whole class telling you about me and why I do what I do and why the class is the way it is, but I want to learn about you too. So and um, this is your completion grade for today. It is worth a grade. So I want you to go and fill this out um, and finish it. But you have it, some questions might take longer, whatever you can do it now if you want. But if you need to like take a my boss always calls them bio breaks. If you need water, if you need to go to the bathroom, whatever, walk around, spread your legs, you're welcome to do that. And just have, you have till the end of the day to submit this to me. So I'll be grading it tomorrow morning and reading it so I can know what kind of like questions to embed or examples and stuff to learn about y'all. Okay. I use tinyurl.com a lot, if you can't tell. Okay, it's break time. I'm gonna give you 10 minutes. So we'll come back here at 1220 and then we'll begin Leo Kemp Sprint.
If you have any questions, if you want to come up here and talk to me, you are more than welcome to do that. Hey. I got an email about it, about one. Um, so I plan on going in and doing all kinds of stuff today. If, if I haven't, if yeah. you don't see it pop up. I don't know what will pop on your screen. You can email me. And I think we just talked about it. So if we want um, for a discussion now or at a quick time. Um, yeah, why don't you, will you email me? And then we can decide if we need to meet in person or I can just take care of it on my own. Mm -hmm. Whatever thoughts you have, that way it will be privately. I think there are going to be a lot of people in my office this summer, so it's going to be hard for us to get a private space. So I want to know. So you can just. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Dang, you're already doing the work. Well, because for this one, it says it's 17, but I remember from chapter 13 on conjugated unsaturated systems that both of these are like SP2. That's why it's like resonates. Which ones are SP2? D and B. Because it, it just says an answer. D is actually not SP2 hybridized. So I think you might be thinking about aromatic mo molecules. In lone pairs, hybridize unless they can go into an aromatic system. Well, is it different when it's like like one of these systems? Because when yep. I was with Dr. Berhe, and that's how they described it as like SP2 and they connect them mm -hmm. all the way. So that's a conjugated system. So they can go basically lone pairs. We kind of have the disadvantage of having finished SP2 once already, right? So lone pairs will do whatever they can to make themselves the most stable. Uh, so at this point, hybridization is the most stable thing they can do because there's no uh, conjugated system. But if there's conjugation or resonance, uh, aromatic system that they can go into, they'll go into a few of those, so they'll be in resonance because that will be more stable. Okay. But you don't have to worry about that at all until you get back into unfinished resonance. Okay. So, I don't tell my students about the hand thing before I tend to because it's just confusing. So you can think of lone pairs as going into the hybrid because that's going to be the most stable thing. Okay. And then also another question. You had chapter 11 up there. Are we going over alcohols for this? Because Dr. Berry's chapter 11 is alcohol and mm -hmm. alcohol, and that's where he starts for four times two. Yeah. So what it probably won't get through everything on this one. Um, so what what I have from chapter eleven is actually the same stuff from chapter eight. So chapter eight is addition to double bond, yeah. and so you make alcohols in chapter eight. And so I like to say, okay, and now I'm going to give you a jump start on chapter eleven. All these same concepts are in chapter eleven, um, just to kind of help out with that um, and draw those connections for when you get to open two, uh, and then we'll go into that. For that. Okay, cool. So I'll you've just, already taken out some more anal thinking? Yeah, I got in C and okay one. I needed an A because I just want to up my GPA. So yeah. what did you do in open two? I got an A. Nice. That whole that whole break, I was like, okay, I'm gonna study and finally understand. And I realized there's a lot of concepts around it. Like yeah. Electronegativity. It was like basic concepts that yeah. Mold. Okay. Well, that's cool. There might be other situations like this where you're like, wait, an OCHEM team is slightly different, and it's because we build the foundation and then go deeper in OCHEM too. So, like, this isn't a system that can be in resonance, so hybridization is the best it can do. So, we'll just okay. leave it at that for now. And then we would talk about resonance and conjugation more in, in OCHEM 2 than we talked about that earlier in the field. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. So, you mentioned modern and shit off Amazon. I was looking to get it. But you also said something about like not getting the one that was too hard to use. So I was just oh, yeah. I think, like, no, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, that's okay. one of the ones we have upstairs. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so there's one that's like, it comes in a green box. Um, mm -hmm. It's like pieces like this, and you have to like put them together like a puzzle to make tetrahedral. Um, and I'm like so confused by it. And my I'm doing commercial for a long time, so I'm confused by it. I'm like, I buy one. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, that's. Why would you make it this confusing? I think it gives more flexibility for people who are building more complex molecules, but for us, this is all you need. Okay. Just balls and sticks. That's good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to leave it. Yeah, I was kind of nervous for one of my words. Uh, and no, this helped a lot. I really appreciate your teaching. Oh, that, that makes me so happy. Yeah, because I do think 
I think I can get the bad rap and it'll make me sad, which is really not the point of the whole story. <laughs> it's super cute. I checked out your podcast before. Doing, you did? Yeah, oh, cool. so I'm gonna listen to you later. I um the other thing about the way that we teach now is that it's really hard to build in context-based examples because we're at such a fast pace. So some people have asked me how I recommend they change their organic chemistry course. And I'm like, cut back on the material, mm -hmm. do context-based examples. But if I do that, then I'm kind of screwing you guys over for the future, right? Because you have to know everything before you have a different teacher than me. Mm -hmm. So that podcast is kind of my way to be like. You can do it. You can do contest based examples, but you have to do it on your own. Time. That's super cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. If you have any ideas for episodes, oh, let me know. Yeah. Okay, so on my MTI, I said this was required, so I bought it, but I wasn't sure if people were going to use it or if it would be useful at all. Yeah, that was um, updated. They didn't ask me for the summer if that was still required. Dr. Berry, I think, uses that. I chose not to use it for the summer because Achieve is really um, really helpful because you get immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. You're going to get immediate feedback from me on the quiz and stuff yeah. anyway because our class is so fast paced. Mm -hmm. And it takes a long time because there's like software things that are coming mm -hmm. in and in and Yeah. So I chose to do the like manual instead okay. to make it oh, yeah. easier and like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm taking one thing with Ken too. Anyways, do you think it would be useful to keep it or should I try to return it? I would email Dr. Berryhand. He can sometimes try to get a hold of okay. and see if he's gonna use it. Okay. But if you can return it, that might be better because then you can just buy it again next time. Yeah. And then you're guaranteed to not so yeah it's just such a bummer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. You guys can talk. You don't have to be quiet. Feel free to chat amongst yourselves. I'm going to pull up the notes. Okay, you say we're coming back 1220. Okay, we're about there. Let me make sure I have everything ready. All right, so I'll, in about a minute, we'll come back together. Just to give you guys time to get to the same.
All right, let's get going. Chapter one, the basics. Okay, so I know all of you, have, a lot of you have come from different universities. You had different Gen Chem 1 instructors. It may be a long time since you took Gen Chem 1. So I'm going to go over everything that you need to know from Gen Chem that's important for this class. And that's a lot of what chapter one is and a little bit of chapter two as well. I also wanted to say on the syllabus, I have my ideal schedule, but we'll take the time we take to get through what we can get through. And um, I've built in a few chapters that it's like, well, if we can't cover this, it'll be okay because Dr. Berhey starts at a at a chapter 11. So if we need to readjust, we can. That's just my ideal schedule. So I want you to learn well. We'll do what we can do to get through it. Okay, so uh, today's chapter is, again, all about review. So we've got the octet rule, how to do a Lewis structure, formal charges, um, isomers, all kinds of fun things, and then the basic uh, notation for organic chemistry. So organic chemistry is the chemistry of com compounds that contain the element carbon. What's fun about being a woman in science is people think that you don't know things. And so I said that on my podcast, and someone wrote in and told me I was wrong. But this is literally the definition of organic chemistry. So this is organic chemistry. If there's one carbon in it, it's an organic molecule. That's also why um, the organic notation on foods doesn't quite make sense because pretty much all foods are organic to a degree. Um, they mean something different than what we mean. So when I say organic compounds, that's what I'm talking about. Carbon molecules, carbon containing molecules. If there's no carbon in it at all, it's called inorganic. So like table salt is NaCl, that's inorganic, um, but carbon dioxide, that's organic because there's a carbon there. Uh, carbon compounds are central to the structure of living organisms. You have so many carbon-based compounds in your body. Um, I'm pretty sure DNA has carbon in it, but water, no, nope, water doesn't. <laughs> DNA has carbon in it, the air we breathe has carbon in it. The food we eat has carbon in it. Proteins have carbon in it. Um, there's carbon everywhere in your body and in the world around us. Um, a lot of organic compounds also have hydrogen, although that's not necessary, uh, but a lot of them do. And that's why they're called sometimes hydrocarbons because they have hydrogens and carbons are primarily what makes them up, if you've ever heard that word. Most organic compounds, though, have also, many, have nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine. Uh, those are the big ones you'll see, chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine, and then oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur, I feel like are the biggest non-carbon, non-hydrogen molecules that show up in this course. So what's nice about organic chemistry is we don't have to worry about the whole periodic table, and we don't have to worry past P orbitals. We don't have to do anything with D orbitals in this class. <laughs> so that's kind of nice. Um, carbon atoms, what makes them really awesome is that they can form strong bonds to other carbon atoms, and they can form strong bonds to those other, what we call hetero atoms. So atoms that are not carbon or hydrogen in an organic compound. Um, and because of those properties, it's Again, the basis for a huge diversity of life. And I like to show some carbon compounds that you've seen before. We'll go over this notation uh, a little bit later today, but anywhere there's basically an angle that indicates carbons and possibly some hydrogens. We'll talk more about that today. But so aspirin is a carbon based molecule. This is an organic compound. Testosterone, for those of you who are pre med and who are going to have to learn all about hormones. Most hormones are carbon-based compounds. Uh, chlorophyll, so, you know, the thing that makes plants green. Um, and actually, chlorophyll is the best solar panel in the world. Plants are the best solar panel in the world. You might feel like, um, one thing that's interesting about science is they teach you, like, oh, we know how photosynthesis works, right? Chlorophyll absorbs light, and then, you know, it puts energy into the plant, and that's stored as starch. We can't recreate that. We can't make as batteries that are as good as starch at storing energy. We can't convert the sunlight into energy at the same rate that plants can, and we definitely can't store it. So nature's pretty incredible, right? Like 
chlorophyll and the things that it does are amazing. And all that starts with carbon-based molecules and the movements of electrons. That was actually my organic research was about how to make artificial silicon. And then Teflon, that is one that maybe doesn't feel like an organic molecule because it um, puts metal pans a lot of times, right? But the backbone of this is carbon with two fluorines. And then that just repeats over and over in a molecule that's uh, called a polymer. Polymers are, you don't need to write this down, but they're big molecules that have the same repeating unit over and over like a necklace, right? So like you have a bead over and over and that makes a necklace. That's what a polymer is. So Teflon just has this repeating unit over and over and it makes one big molecule and that can coat your pan and that makes it non-stick. Yes. Fluorine. I might have said fluorine, but fluorine with an F. Yeah, fluorine. Um, but also Teflon's sketchy. So try not to use Teflon pans because the people who made it are not nice. And if you are going to use Teflon, don't preheat it because if you heat it without food and it gets to a certain temperature, it starts to emit gases that are not safe, especially if you have birds in your house, but probably also for humans. Why are you laughing? It's so true. <laughs> um, I have studied a lot about things. I don't believe in fear mongering. I think chemicals are everywhere and they're great, but I also believe in educating. So be careful when you use your top on Um, Okay, organic chemistry is all about electrons. So what we're gonna do a lot of in electrons or in this class is follow the movement of electrons, see how electrons make bonds, see what electrons are attracted to. We are going to spend a lot of time talking about where electrons hang out, that's what we're doing in organic chemistry. So I really want to encourage you to learn about the electrons and what they're attracted to and how they move and how to denote that movement. Um, that's going to really, really help you out as you move into OCHEM 2. So a reminder, valent shell is that outermost shell used in bonding in organic chemistry. So I'm going to switch to the visualizer here. Um, <clears throat> So when we talk about electrons or um, when we talk about atoms, you have an innermost S orbital and that has um, two electrons that can hang out there, right? And it's not really a perfect circle. What orbitals kind of denote is there's a, an area where electrons like to hang out. And mathematically, we've calculated that they're most likely to be in the spherical zone. That's where like the electrons are moving around in. Uh, but it's easy to draw it as a circle here. And sometimes it's also drawn with the, the orbital as like a line. And then you put the two electrons in, if you remember that from Gen Chem. So that's the 1s orbital. And then around that, there's the 2s orbital. So then you get two more s. And then we have p orbitals. So if you remember p orbitals, there's one that goes straight up and down. And there's one in the plane of the page. And then there's one that kind of goes, we're gonna draw it as a dash line because it's like poking back into the page. And then um, like a fat line because this is coming out towards us in the Z axis, right? So we have the Y axis, the X axis, and then the Z axis. So it's literally going like into the page. Um, so, Anything that's in the outermost S or uh, P orbitals is considered valence electrons. And in carbon, we have how many valence electrons in carbon? I heard somebody say it. Do you remember how to find the valence electrons? So I heard somebody say no. Great. So let's go to the periodic table. There's also one on the wall here. There's these numbers up at the top that are a quick guide to how many um, valence electrons are present, but you have to cover up the one for these. So there's only three, four, five, six, seven, and eight valence electrons on these. So that's a quick way for you to find out how many valence electrons without having to do the whole thing where you go through how many electrons total are there. Um, Somebody had gone in and written them up above these, but I guess I got claimed this summer. Okay, so um, on your periodic table, you, you know, you can remember you just cover up the one. So there's four valence electrons in carbon. There's six electrons total in carbon. 
So we have one S filled up, hydrogen and helium. And then we get to two S. There's two electrons filled up in two S as well. And then there's uh, two P. So anything in the outermost P and S are our valence electrons that we're working with. So carbon has four valence electrons. Okay, so that's a review of valence electrons. Um, so sorry, the number in the valence shell is equal to the group number. Sometimes the group numbers say like just the four, they sometimes have the 14 and sometimes they say like 4a, 5a, whatever. Just remember the non one number at the top there. And then these electrons, you've used them in Lewis drought structures, but you're also going to use them a lot in organic molecules. So we'll use a ton of valence electrons. We're going to be living our lives in the valence shell this semester. Chemical bonds come from the way that those electrons are shared or shifted. So ionic bonds, it's really more of a spectrum. There's not like a, a hard line between these, but ionic bonds are when the majority of the electrons have shifted to be around um, the other atoms. So in table salt, NaCl, sodium has lost one of its outermost electrons. That's why it's positive. My favorite way to remember this is my cousin told me a joke in like the eighth grade and I've never forgotten it, that an atom runs into a bar and says, I think I lost an electron. And the bartender says, are you positive? That's how I remember it to this day. I'm 32, I still remember it that way. Um, so, if you lose an electron, you're positive, and then that electron density shifting over towards the chlorine makes that chlorine negative, and then the attraction between the positive and negative it was is what holds them near each other. So that's an ionic bond. A covalent bond is more of electrons being shared. So I like to imagine this is like two people holding hands instead of like, you know, or two people hold, holding on to something instead of one person taking it and the other person not having it. You can think of it as like children with a TV screen, you know, if like one kid takes the screen completely, the other kid's going to be right here looking over their shoulder, or they'll be sharing it equally together. That's electron density. Um, atoms want eight electrons for the most part in their outermost shell. Uh, the exception to that is in that first row, if they start to lose electrons, they'll only have two, like hydrogen, helium want two instead of eight. But for the most part, they want eight. Um, and when there is something that's electronegative, it sort of starts to shift from uh, a perfectly shared bond more towards the ionic side, right? So if an ionic bond is an electron has been completely lost and they're connected by their charge and a covalent bond is two electrons being perfectly evenly shared between two atoms, once an atom has a different electronegativity than the other, it can pull more electron density towards itself resulting in a polar bond. So we kind of have a spectrum. So back to the visualizer, I go. I love to visualize things. Um, I'm gonna draw, let's do, if two hydrogen atoms each have an electron, they can evenly share that, those together. Neither one is like pulling the game of tug of war more. They each have an s orbital with one electron and they're overlapping. And so together they have uh, two electrons, which fills the hydrogen bonds octet rule, the two duet rule or whatever. So that's a perfectly evenly shared. This is a perfectly covalent bond. Um, and remember, it's kind of like a cloud of electrons around here. So if you come towards it with something negative or positive, that electron density can shift. It's not permanently distributed that way. But if it's by itself, that's how the electrons are shared. If you have uh, sodium chloride, sodium has lost its outermost valence shell is empty, and chlorine has filled up its outermost valence shell. So that's negative, that's positive, and then they want to be near each other because opposites attract in science. And then on the spectrum would be if you have hydrogen and fluorine, it would be somewhere in between this. It's not quite a perfectly shared covalent bond. It is a type of covalent bond still, but it's not perfectly shared. And it's not completely where one side is negative or positive. 
but this fluorine is really good at pulling electrons towards itself. It wants electrons. If, if you imagine a game of tug of war, it's way stronger than the hydrogen. So it's pulling electrons towards itself. And because of that, there's less electrons over here. So the hydrogen is slightly positive, and then this fluorine is slightly negative. So if you're sort of imagining the electron density, there's less electron density here and more over here. So it's not quite an ionic bond, but there is, this side is more negative because it has more electrons. This side is more positive because it's lost electrons. Oh, how is it already 1237? Okay. Um, so that's electronegativity. To do a Lewis structure, um, I had planned to go over examples of this, but I don't think we have time. I think um, everybody close your eyes. Raise your hand if you feel good about drawing Lewis structures. Okay. Uh, put your hand down. Raise your hand if you want to spend a little bit of time. Okay, you can open it. So I'll go over it quickly and then I'll make sure there are questions like this in your recitation work and there are some wonder questions about this. So how you write Lewis structures is you count up the number of valence electrons. And I already talked about how you find the number of valence electrons on the periodic table. You add them all up. You figure out what the structure of the molecule is. <laughs> This is the hardest part to me of doing low structures, but what's amazing about being an organic chemist is you never really have to do this because there's clues written into the organic chemistry language that tell you what the structure is for the most part. We'll talk about that. Then you draw in the bonds that connect the atoms and then do your math, math up your electrons to see what you have left and fill in anything without enough left. So let's do the Lewis structure of CH3Br together. So the total number, go back to the uh, CH3Br, the way I do it, I've done it the same way since I was in college because I routines kind of help me, is I say carbon has four valence electrons based on where it is on the periodic table. Hydrogen has one and bromine has seven. So hydrogen has one, bromine has seven. So I do that. And then I say there's one carbon. So that equals times one is four. There's three hydrogens. Uh, one times three is three. And then there's what? Yeah. And then there's one bromine. So you add that up. Seven plus three is 10 and then 14. So 14 total electrons. Now, if this wasn't an organic chemistry class, you'd have to figure out what molecules at the center. And you usually pick the um, can't remember if most or least electronegative, but you don't have to do that in organic chemistry because there's clues. So in organic chemistry, if there's a carbon, that's going to be the center for the most part. And what comes after it surrounds it until you get to the next carbon. So we have a carbon, three hydrogens, and a bromine. Nice. We don't have to worry about which electron goes at the center because it's usually carbon. It's the best. So in this case, we have all these bonds. They are each made up of two electrons. So that's two, four, six, eight. So 14 minus eight leaves six electrons. Then we go through and look at the valence structure and see what doesn't have a full octet. So this hydrogen is bonded to two things, full octet. This hydrogen, or sorry, bond, not bonded to two things, has one bond, so it has two electrons. So that's a full octet for hydrogen, which only needs two. Same thing with this hydrogen and with this hydrogen. Then we look at the carbon. It has one, two, three, four bonds around it. Four bonds, each made up of two electrons, full octet. So then the only thing that is left is bromine, which only has one bond to it. And it wants eight, not two electrons. So it's not happy. But luckily we have six leftover electrons, so we can just fill them in. Two, four, six. And there we have our full octet, and we've used up all of our electrons. So that's the basics of writing Lewis structures. You need to know those basics, but I wouldn't panic if, like, nitrogen is kind of a weird hard one to do a lot. You know, I always get confused when there's nitrogen involved or whatever. Usually there will be clues. 
So for example, if you have CH3, CH2, Br, um, and then another CH2, CH2, yeah, let's just do CH2, CH3, Br. You have a carbon and it goes in the center and whatever comes after it until you get the next carbon surround it. So you have a carbon in the center surrounded by three hydrogens. Sometimes my hydrogens look like fours. It's because organic chemists don't like to draw hydrogens. That's why we're eventually going to get to a shorthand notation. So this carbon surrounded by three hydrogens, and then we get to the next carbon, and it's the next thing in the chain, surrounded by two hydrogens and a bromine. So we know the structure based on this condensed formula that's typically used in organic chemistry. It is very rare in organic chemistry for you to see something like this written as C2H5Br. If it was written like that, you'd have to do a lot more work to try to figure out what this structure is. But because it's written in the order that it appears on the page, life is a lot easier. So as long as you can kind of understand how to get this Lewis structure from this, this little structure from that, you're good to go. And then I'm not going to do all the math, but this bromine would have six electrons around it too. So that's a quick review of Lewis structures, there are some on your practice problems as well. Oh, we already did our practice break. Okay. So then we get into formal charges. And formal charge is um, the charge of an individual atom if the whole molecule was a charge. So a lot of times when you learn polyatomic atoms in Gen Chem, you kind of have like a bracket and a plus or a minus. Formal charge identifies where that plus or minus is within the molecule, basically. What thing is positive or negative? It's very easy to do. It's the number of valence electrons minus the number of bonds minus the um, number of electrons, not electron pairs, electrons. There's a very confusing formula from the book that I hate and I never use. Don't do that. Do, um, it's not electron pairs, it's just electrons. That was my mistake. I'll fix it. But do that or do uh, valence electrons minus dots minus lines. I hate doing it that way because I'm like, dots and lines are actually like electrons that are overlapping and interacting. So I don't want you to think of them as dots and lines. But for your exam, if you need to think of them as dots and lines to get the right formal charge, go ahead. So formal charge is, it's, if you can think of it like that, minus dots, minus lines, your life is going to be easier. A fun fact, the very first time I ever taught organic chemistry, I forgot how to do formal charge in front of a class of 200 students. Oh, it was so embarrassing. Okay, so I'm going to give you this example. Don't worry about this down here. These are carbons. We'll get to that in a second. But we're going to look at this, um, this oxygen right here. To find the formal charge of this oxygen, we would look at the number of valence electrons. What's the valence electrons of oxygen? There's six valence electrons on oxygen. And how many bonds are around this? There's one bond. The oxygen goes to this carbon right here. That's one bond. And how many electrons? Not electron pairs, electrons. Six. So six minus one minus six is negative one. So this oxygen is negative. Now let's do water, not an organic molecule, but useful for calculating formal charge. Again, how many valence electrons does oxygen have? Six. How many bonds does this oxygen have? Two. And how many electrons? Four. So there's no charge on this oxygen. Okay, and then let's do another one from OCHEM or from GenChem, the hydronium ion. Hopefully you remember that, that good old thing. How many valence electrons? Six. How many bonds? How many, uh, I almost said dots. How many electrons? Two. So six minus three minus two is one, so that's positive. I already wrote the positive there because it's so ingrained in me that that's positive. I gave you the answer. Um, so that's the idea of formal charge. Formal charge, I think, Students do pretty well when it's in that form, when they're like, the dots and lines are all drawn in. What gets confusing is when the formal charge is put on the atom and you have to infer how many dots and lines are there. I think that's where students kind of struggle with formal charge. 
Okay, so um, this is just kind of a summary of common uh, common formal charges. You'll see you can use this as practice. Um, you'll you don't need to memorize this or anything. This is just something as you go through, you'll get used to. Oxygen with two bonds and two lone pairs, neutral. Oxygen with three bonds and one lone pair, positive. Oxygen with six electrons and one bond, negative. Like you'll just start to see those patterns. And this slide is really trying to help you see some of those patterns. That's all this slide is about. Okay, what time is it? My watch is setting stuff over. Oh, we're almost out of time. I'll start touching on this and we'll finish up in class um, tomorrow. So one thing that, this is part of the work that my advisor does that I was talking about with visualizing molecules. One thing that we do a lot in organic chemistry is we give you different representations of molecules. So we want you to be able to visualize what molecules look like. So we have a lot of different ones. Um, this right here is called the ball and stick model. And that's what, you know, my modeling kit is a ball and stick model. So you can like hold a molecule and look at it. This is a good representation, but it's not 100% accurate, right? Because these are actually clouds of electrons in orbitals that are overlapping and they have different shapes. So we'll talk about how to represent orbitals as well. Um, and it's not really useful for drawing on a piece of paper, right? Because how do you draw this on a piece of paper if you're not an artist? You don't. So what we have instead is Lewis structures like you've seen. Um, and sometimes Lewis structures, instead of drawing out the bonds, they'll do these two little dots. Uh, biochemists use that more than oh, organic chemists, I think. There's the dash formula, which is basically the Lewis formula, like we just drew Lewis structures like that. There's the condensed formula, which is the one that has the cheats in it that show you the, the hints about where molecules go. CH3, CH2, CH2, so you know the CH carbon has three hydrogens, this carbon has two hydrogens, this carbon has two hydrogens, and then the oxygen at the end. Um, and then there's something that organic chemists use a lot because we're lazy and we don't want to draw a bajillion hydrogens in. Uh, called bond line formula. And bond line formula basically is the one that you see like big organic chemistry molecules written out are usually written in this. And what this represents is every bend or end is what I like to call it. So the bend here or the end here represents a carbon. And you assume a neutral formal charge and that it's filled in to hydrogens to get it to its neutral formal charge. So right here, this carbon is neutral. It only has one bond represented. So there must be three hydrogens around it. So that's kind of uh, the language that organic chemists use. And when I talk about, oh, we're going to show you a new language and then you have to be fluid in it immediately, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so, and what I think is cool about this is all three of these are the same molecule, but they're all different ways to represent the same molecule. And there's even more ways to represent this molecule. If you think about orbitals and how those are overlapping, or um, we'll learn some more as we go through the course. So there's just a lot of different ways to represent molecules. And one of the things I want you to be good at by the end of this class is being able to use different representations of the same molecule for different things. And that will help you as you go through. Um, so the condensed formula, like I talked about, is that one that's just has the clues as to where things go. And then we'll start class on Tuesday with going through bond line formula. Um, where each line is a bond, each bend or end is a carbon atom. No carbon is ever written, it's just the line, and the lines between mean a bond. Um, and then how you fill in hydrogen. So I encourage you to look at that and practice before class because um, that's one of the biggest things you'll need to be good at by the end of class is going through condensed to bond line. Okay, if you have questions, I'll be around for a little bit. Um, I'll post this video online, and if you need anything, 